let me tell you what is pernicious anemia. Let me define for you what is pernicious anemia. Very sad. What is pernicious anemia? Pernicious anemia is, now I will go to step by step. Pernicious anemia is macrocytic megaloblastic anemia due to B12 deficiency which is due to which is due to intrinsic factor deficiency which must be due to which must be due to autoimmune destruction of gastric mucosa auto immune destruction of of gastric fund, fundus fundic mucosa remember every person having b12 deficiency is not suffering with pernicious anemia every person having deficiency of intrinsic factor is not having pernicious anemia pernicious anemia the very special type of b12 deficiency when a person develop b12 deficiency due to intrinsic factor deficiency and that intrinsic factor deficiency should be due to destruction of what is this Funda, fundus of the gastric muco gastric mucosa of the fundus due to autoimmune process it's a very unique clinical pathological situation Actually, what happened in the past? Then there was autoimmunity. If autoimmunity, autoimmune process was attacking the, what are these cells? What were these cells? Parietal cells. cells. If autoantibodies and T, autoreactive T cells and autoantibodies were destroying the, what is this thing? Parietal cells. Destroying the gastric glands. Then intrinsic factor was not produced. When intrinsic factor was not produced due to this autoimmune process, uh, destruction of the gastric mucosa, what was happening? There was chronic intrinsic factor deficiency, B12 was not being absorbed, and internal B12 stores were accumulated over the years, and eventually person developed very severe macrocytic megaloblastic anemia with neurological dysfunctions. Right? And it progressively worsens because whatever vitamin B12 at that time they were giving orally, that was not absorbing. Is that right? Eventually, patient used to die in the past. So doctors only knew this thing. There is some very dangerous anemia which kills the person. Pernicious mean dangerous. So when they put the name pernicious anemia mean dangerous anemia. Is that right? So pernicious anemia is one of the causes of B12 deficiency anemias. Is that right? But it is the most common cause of B12 deficiency anemia. But B12 deficiency may be due to some other mechanisms also. As I told you, you remove my stomach and throw into dustbin. You have done some surgery on me. You have done gastrectomy. Of course, intrinsic factor is not there. Do you think it can be called Pernicious anemia? No, because it is not autoimmune process. You are getting it? To label a person to pernicious anemic patient, we have to have a person with what? Macrocytic megaloblastic anemia, may or may not be neurological dysfunction, all of them due to B12 deficiency, which should be due to deficiency of intrinsic factor. But the most important point is deficiency of intrinsic factor should be involving the autoimmune process in the body. Is that right? Be aware of diagnosing pernicious anemia before the age of 40. Pernicious anemia is more common after the age of 40. Right? If you are taking 20 year old child and saying this, that is not a child, I think adolescent. Right? And you say he has pernicious anemia, you are not a good clinician. Is that right? The most common, usually pernicious anemia is around the age of 60, 70, 80. Is that right? Now I will ask another question. Let us suppose someone has taken a lot of corrosives. You know, young boy of 20, 
the sweetheart leaves him and he becomes very emotional and he tries to kill himself by corrosives, you know, acids. And acids go down and burn all this fundic mucosa, but somehow person is saved. Later on, he will develop what? Intrinsic factor deficiency, B12 deficiency, macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. Can this macrocytic megaloblastic anemia called pernicious anemia? No, now you are intelligent. You cannot call it pernicious anemia because it does not involve the autoimmune process. Is that right? Because when we talk about pernicious anemia, as I told you, it is usually more common in older age. And usually, this disease is coming in cluster. It is associated, there is higher frequency of some other autoimmune diseases in the same person or in his relatives. It is quite possible, I have autoantibodies against parietal cell and intrinsic factor. My, fr my brother has autoantibodies against thyroid. My sister has autoantibodies against the adrenal cortex. So what will happen? My brother who has autoantibodies against the thyroid, he may develop Hashimoto's thyroiditis. My sister, which has autoantibodies destroying the adrenal cortex, she may develop autoimmune Addison's disease. And other brother get autoimmune process attacking the melanocyte, he may do, develop vitiligo. So actually, this is a group of diseases. They are sister diseases, autoimmune diseases, which tend to run in the families. They tend to cluster in the families. What are these diseases? Yes, pernicious anemia. Vitiligo, Hashimoto's thyroiditis or autoimmune thyroiditis, thyroiditis, autoimmune parathyroid deficiency, autoimmune process destroy the thyroid gland or parathyroid gland or destroy the adrenal cortex. Is that right? So it means these patients have a tendency of autoimmune reactions. So pernicious anemia is a very special type of anemia. Is that right? Yes, what's your question? Okay, in regards to pernicious anemia, if, there's, if it's an autoimmune attack against the parietal cells, right? Yeah. Would that also cause, uh, can it also cause a pernicious anemia due to um, agular, agular injury? No, listen. Actually, the patient who have pernicious anemia in which there is destruction of parietal cells, they develop Intrinsic factor deficiency as well as they develop achlorhydria. At the same time. Simultaneously because parietal cell secrete protons and also secrete intrinsic factor. And other enzymes, gastric juice are secreted by chief cells. Actually in pernicious anemia, there are autoimmune process which is destroying the parietal cells. This is what is an answer of average doctor. But excellent doctor will say, even though autoimmune, pro if you really want to go into detail of pernicious anemia, let's go there. In pernicious anemia, what really happens, number one, there's autoimmune process, right? Now, this autoimmune process, primarily, this is T cells. The T cells are attacking what? Parietal cells, and they're destroying the parietal cells. When parietal cells are destroyed, proteins of the parietal cells are released into circulation. When parietal cells are destroyed, proteins, injured cell, release their proteins into circulation. Are you with me understanding? When these proteins come into circulation, they get exposed to the immune system. And immune system make autoantibodies against those proteins. There are some proteins which are sequestered into these cells. Sequestered means hidden. There are some proteins which are present in parietal cells. They are hidden, hidden from the, they are hiding from the immune system. All your life, your immune system never knows those proteins are there. So the immune system is not making antibodies. But when the autoreactive T cell destroy the parietal cell, parietal cell components and proteins are released into circulation in some patient, immune system attack against those proteins. So second step is, first step was cellular immunity, then antibody response. Are you with me or not? Yes. These antibodies go to the immune headquarters and what comes out? Antibodies. Now these antibodies, Number one, these antibodies will react with what? Parietal cell. Which component of the parietal cell? What is this component of parietal cell? Proton secretor. Some of these antibodies react with proton secretors. Right? 
these antibodies are also called antiparietal cell antibodies. Is that right? This is one antibody type I'm mentioning. It is one type of antibody. Secondly, so we can say antibody response can be divided further into okay three. Number one, anti parietal cell parietal cell antibodies. Is that clear? These anti parietal cell antibodies react with the parietal cell, right? Especially with alpha and beta unit of the proton secretor. Then another group of antibodies appear. This is the second group of antibodies. This is green antibody, let's suppose in my diagram. This is different than the black antibody. Black antibody was anti parietal cell antibody. Green antibody, this is something like people who get jealous, you know, when someone is making love, the other people who are jealous. Frankie, you know these things, isn't it? <laughs> right? This antibody is like that. When intrinsic factor, look, an intrinsic factor love to interact with B12, this antibody is really jealous. You know what it does? This antibody binds here. Can B12 bind there? No. So this antibody, this is another type of antibody which love to react with the intrinsic factor. But which part of the intrinsic, which domain of intrinsic factor? The domain of intrinsic factor which bind with B12. So it does not allow the B12 and intrinsic factor to make a loving complex. Is that right? Then there is blue antibody. Life is not easy for even intrinsic factor. There is a blue antibody which is formed. This antibody bind with the intrinsic factor but at this point. What is this point? The point where with which it was going to bind with? What is this? Receptors on the? So B12 is there but antibody is bound here. Now B12 and folic acid, oh sorry, B12 and intrinsic factor can make a complex, but this complex cannot enter into its house. You are understanding? It cannot bind with allele cells. This is, so three types of antibodies are made in pernicious anemia. There is no concept of diagnosing pernicious anemia without autoimmune reaction. Now you understand it, isn't it? Now, which antibody is the most specific for this disease? This black antibody, green antibody or blue antibody? Black antibody is, listen, black antibody is anti parietal cell antibody. Green is anti-intrinsic factor. Listen, green is anti-intrinsic factor. Blue is also anti-intrinsic factor. But green bind, react on the intrinsic factor and does not allow the intrinsic factor to bind with B12. And a blue antibody react with the intrinsic factor and intrinsic factor is unable to bind with the Receptor. allele receptors. Is that right? Out of these three, which is the most specific antibody for pernicious anemia? The central. This is almost diagnostic of pernicious anemia. The most specific blood test for pernicious anemia is that person have antibodies which are directed against intrinsic factor Especially which do not allow such autoantibodies which do not allow B12 and intrinsic factor interaction. Now, why antiparietal cell antibodies are less specific? Let me tell you. You will be surprised that if you check the blood of 100 persons, more than 70 years of age, 10 to 15 percent have normally these antiparietal cell antibodies but they don't have pernicious anemia because they do not have antibody directed against intrinsic factor components. So 10 to 15 percent of elderly patients have anti parietal cell antibodies at low level. So some anti parietal cells are destroyed but still some parietal cells are working but there are no antibody directed against the intrinsic factor. So still they can absorb enough B12. So just having this antibody is not enough to diagnose pernicious anemia. Another thing. There are many people who have atrophic gastritis. There are many people who have atrophic gastritis but not pernicious anemia. The autoimmune process attack, what is this? Gastric mucosa. And due to chronic inflammation and chronic damage, mucosa become atrophied. 
but still it produces little bit intrinsic factor which is enough to absorb the B12. But there is no antibody against the intrinsic factor. In that case, we will say patient has a trophic gastritis but not pernicious anemia. Pernicious anemia occur when not only this antibody is there but these two are also there, specifically this one. Because when this is there, intrinsic factor production is less. But when this is there, whatever intrinsic factor is there, it is unable to bind with B12 and real disaster is there. So in serological test, having antiparietal antibody is not specific for pernicious anemia, but anti-intrinsic factor antibody, especially which do not allow the B12 to react with the intrinsic factor are most specific. Clear? Right? I hope you are clear about the pernicious anemia. Now let me tell you in pernicious anemia patients what will happen. We will write here step by step all the things. Then I will go to other causes of deficiency of B12. Right? Pernicious anemia. In a patient with pernicious anemia, what will you find? Of course, you should start, this is the bone marrow and here is the blood. First of all, in pernicious anemia, you can, you want to start from where? You want to start from bone marrow or you want to start from blood or you want to start from GIT? That's your choice, what you want. Because they have a problem in bone marrow, they have problems in the blood, picture, they have problem in the gastric mucosa and of course they have neurological dysfunction. So you want to start from where? Okay, so my friend is saying we should start from bone marrow, fine. This is a stem cell, stem cell going to lymphoid stem cell and myeloid stem cell, myeloid stem cell going to erythroid series, producing RBCs, it go into megakaryoid series and it produces platelets and it produces granulopoiesis also and it produces neutrophils and others. Is that right? Now listen, when B12 deficiency is there, in pernicious anemia of course there is B12 deficiency. But this changes which I am going to discuss, this is not only in pernicious anemia, it is present in all B12 deficiency. So in B12 deficiency, all the hematopoietic precursor cells undergo megaloid reaction because all of them have deficiency of B12, all of them have deficiency of supply of nitrogenous based thymidine for DNA replication. So all of the cell even in erythroid series or megakaryoid series or in granulopoiesis, all of them have immature nuclei with fully mature cytoplasm. Are you understanding? So you have megaloblastic reaction in erythroid pathway as well as granulopoietic pathway. Now in the erythroid pathway I told you that what is the normal development? Normal development is this is proerythroblast, it is progressively becoming smaller. Then early normal blast, intermediate, late, reticulocyte, RBC. As we are going to mature side, cell is progressively decreasing in size, number one. Number two, nucleus in the beginning is very large with loose chromatin because DNA is open because cell is replicating. Replicating DNA is open so that DNA can be copied. Is that right? Now, in normal supply of B12 and folic acid, nucleus progressively divides many times and then it becomes condensed and eventually it goes out. Is that right? It becomes very condensed and out and then it is reticulocyte. So when nucleus is initially open, progressively it can keep on replicating and cell undergoes division and eventually it condenses and then goes out. Is that right? This is the normal process, normal nuclear maturation in the cytoplasm. In the beginning, early cell, it is making this nucleus is making lot of RNA. There is lot of replication and lot of transcription. So that RNA is coming into cytoplasm. So cytoplasm is normally blue due to RNA. Then some of this RNA has directed the synthesis of hemoglobin. So it becomes a little red. Then it becomes more hemoglobinized. And then it becomes well hemoglobinized. So what really happened? That cytoplasmic maturation is that basophilic cytoplasm progressively becomes a synophilic. 
this is normal. Now when B12 or folic acid deficiency is, nucleus is unable to mature. So you may find a cell at this stage in which there is a nucleus which is very very immature, open. It is not condensed. It's still waiting that let's replicate enough and condense them. But because it has made lot of messenger RNA, because messenger RNA or protein synthesis remain normal in the, <coughs> in the deficiency of B12 and folic acid, right? So because it has made lot of messenger RNA, so lot of hemoglobin and it is over hemoglobinized, well hemoglobinized cell. Now this cell is abnormal. Why it is abnormal? It's cyto if you look at the cytoplasm, it is very mature because it is well hemoglobinized. So when you look at the nucleus, it is very immature. And when you look at the size, it is also large. So such large abnormal normoblast where nucleus is immature and cytoplasm is well hemoglobinized and mature are called megaloblast. Am I clear? So a recited series will show a lot of megaloblastosis at all these stages. Right? So bone marrow biopsy will show megaloblastosis. But there is one problem. Even though there are a lot of megaloblasts there, there are a lot of megaloblasts there, but most of them undergo apoptosis within the bone marrow. Do you think megaloblasts are normal cells? No. So most of them either undergo apoptotic death, apoptosis, or they are eaten up by macrophages. Only 10% of them truly make RBCs. Now listen carefully. Normally, the women who are good cook, when they are cooking in the kitchen, about 90% of the food they cook well. So 90% of the food come to the dining table. 10% they spoil and that disappear in the kitchen. You never know on the dining table what she has done in the kitchen. So we say how much intra-kitchen losses are there? About 10%. But if there is a woman who is very poor cook or she is not having enough nutrients and enough things to cook. So maybe that poor cook cook in such a bad way that 90% of food is not good and that is destroyed within the kitchen only 10% come on the what? Dining table. When that woman come to your house, kitchen is having more activity but supply on the dining table is less. That is exactly what happened in megaloblastic anemia. That intra-kitchen activity is too much but nothing coming to dining table. What I mean by this? Kitchen means bone marrow house where we cook the RBCs. B12 folic acid deficiency is there, right? There's lot of megaloblastosis, right? But because megaloblasts are abnormal cell, so most of them undergo apoptosis or they undergo macrophage, phagocytic process within the bone marrow and they never convert into mature RBCs. So intramedullary activity is too much, but intramedullary losses are also too much. A normal person, Right now, if I'm normal, my erythropoiesis will be 10% intramedullary losses. But in megaloblastic anemias, 90%, up to 85 to 90% of megaloblastic blast, blasts are lost within bone marrow. They never appear into RBCs. Heavy intra-kitchen losses, heavy intramedullary hemolysis. Are you understanding? So, due to that reason, total RBCs which are produced are less or more? Very less. So red blood cell count is very very less. Even though RBCs which the few RBCs which are produced they are larger than normal because they are not made, derived from normal blast. Few RBCs which are coming they are derived from megaloblast. So few RBCs which come here they are larger in size mean corpuscular volume is high. For example it is 110 femtoliter and these few RBCs which come they have normal hemoglobin or more than normal? More than mean carpuscular volume I told you is suppose 110 femtoliter. It means the macrocyte. Is that right? And mean carpuscular hemoglobin which is normally 30 picogram, they may have 40 picogram. So they are overly hemoglobinized. But mean carpuscular hemoglobin concentration is normal. You know why? If size has been increased, hemoglobin is increased in the same ratio. So concentration of hemoglobin in that RBC volume is normal. Normally what happens, mean corpuscular volume is 
90 femtoliter normally mean corpus flow hemoglobin is 30 picogram and normally mean corpus flow hemoglobin concentration is yes 30 hemoglobin divided by 90 femtoliter is about 33 percent so normally rbc is 33 percent full of hemoglobin claro now come here here size has been increased let's suppose it is 120 femtoliter size has been increased volume has been increased but in the same ratio hemoglobin is also increased so hemoglobin size ratio is increased in the same way so mean corpus of hemoglobin concentration is still 33 percent so what is happening that rbc is a very large but they are very few even though on individual rbc hemoglobin is more but total hemoglobin in the blood is less even though individual rbc is larger but total RBC mass is less. Because of these reasons, there is severe anemia. You are understanding? Hematocrit is less. Packed cell volume is less. Individual RBC may be larger, but total RBC mass is less. Individual RBC may have more than normal hemoglobin, but total hemoglobin concentration is less. less. So, there is anemia. Clear? Secondly, you come to another thing that when anemia is there hypoxia occurs and that forces the kidney to produce more erythropoietin and this stimulates the erythropoietic process so what happens bone marrow become hypercellular bone marrow is hyper hypercellular but blood is hypocellular because intra kitchen activity is too much but nothing coming to the dinner table you are getting it this is what is going on so B12 and folic acid deficiency produces hypercellular bone marrow and bone marrow cellularity is increased. Bone marrow erythropoiesis is not normoblastic, it is megaloblastic. Megakaryoblasts are also abnormal. Megakaryoblasts are also having deficiency of B12 or folic acid and of course in pernicious anemia only B12 deficiency. Megakaryoblasts will also not mature properly. So total supply of Platelets will be less or more? Less. So in severe cases, there is also thrombocytopenia. Is that right? Not only there is anemia, but there is also thrombocytopenia. Then, granulopoiesis. That is also in trouble. There is megaloid reaction in the precursor cell of myelopoiesis or granulopoiesis like pro, uh, pro myeloblast, myeloblast, metamylocyte you are getting it myelocyte band cell all of them are larger than normal as the erythrites precursors were larger in the same way granulopoietic precursors are also larger in the bone marrow you not only find very large abnormal normoblast you also find very very large metamylocytes we call them giant giant metamylocyte so in the bone marrow what you find number one finding is Increased cellularity, hypercellularity. Number two in the bone marrow, what you find? Please speak. Yes, megaloblastic reaction in erythropoietic pathway. Number three, you find giant or very large <coughs> granulopoietic precursor cells like giant metamylocytes. Is that right? This is the thing which are going on in the bone marrow. But when you come to the peripheral blood, RBCs are large, macrocytic. But total number is less, total RBC mass is less, hemoglobin concentration is less, so we call it macrocytic anemia. With that, in severe cases, there may be thrombocytopenia. And of course, in severe cases, do you think neutrophil production is normal or less than normal? So there is leukopenia, and specifically, leukopenia means white cells are less, specifically neutrophils are very less, because they have very short lifespan. Now, what is the li lifespan of normal neutrophil? What is the lifespan of normal neutrophil? Someone is saying 8 hours, someone is saying 3 days. It's weeks. Write it down. RBCs is 120 days. Yes, you should know. I know you know it, but still in comparison write it down. RBC life is 120 days. Platelets life is 7 to 10 days. Neutrophil not playing, neutrophil which are not fighting against infection, lifespan is 2 days. 
Yeah, only two days. That is why in bone marrow failure, the first problem is neutropenia and infection, not anemia, clinically. Two days only. And when neutrophils are fighting against the infection, the lifespan is six to eight hours only. Is that right? That is why in all those diseases which produce severe bone marrow failure, the first problem is not anemia. First problem is neutropenia which produces infection. Second problem is thrombocytopenia. Third is the anemia. Is that right? Anyway, come back. In these patients, they also develop leukopenia or neutropenia. Is that right? No problem here. Another thing which is very important that here the uh, neutrophil may be found in the blood with some nuclear abnormalities, right? Now you tell me that actually, okay, I will tell you directly. You know, neutrophil have their lobes, nucleus lobe, which are multiple segmented. Here the segmentation may be one, two, three, four, five, even six. Hexalobated neutrophils. Or simply we call that in the peripheral blood picture in B12 and folic acid deficiency, we may find hypersegmented neutrophils. Neutrophils with multiple segments of lobe of nucleus. Hypersegmented means lobes more than five. Can you believe the small information is so important? Now hematologists claim that under the high power field, even if you see just one neutrophil of six lobes, nucleus, it is B12 or folic acid deficiency until proved otherwise. It warrants full investigations for deficiency of B12 and folic acid. Am I clear? Right, so bone marrow is hypercellular. All hematopoietic precursor cells are megalloid reactions. Intra bone marrow losses are too much, intramedullary losses. So, how the really anemia develop? In spite of what? Why the anemia develop in spite of hypercellular bone marrow? Because even though bone marrow is hypercellular, but most of the precursor cells die within bone marrow. This is one reason. Second reason is whatever RBCs are produced, they are larger RBCs. And larger RBCs undergo hemolysis easily. So, this component of hemolysis also. There is main problem is reduced production of RBC. With that, they slightly reduce survival of large RBC. So large RBCs tend to get stuck here and there. You are getting it? They are not as flexible. They are overloaded with hemoglobin. Am I clear? So these patients have megaloblastic blastosis in the bone marrow. They have macrocytosis in the peripheral blood picture. But in severe cases, they have not only anemia. They have thrombocytopenia as well as leukopenia. So actually, this should be called, not anemia, this should be called pancytopenia. So these are the findings in hematological abnormalities, bone marrow and hematological. Clear? In patient of pernicious anemia, if you give B12 injections, of course these two things will be corrected. But do you think in patients of pernicious anemia, by giving the B12 injections, can you correct the problems in here? You cannot reverse the changes in or you cannot uh, alter the mucosa, right? Now we come to number one, these two changes. Third, what is the central nervous system changes and peripheral nervous system changes. In previous lectures, I have explained the B12 deficiencies there, there is peripheral neuropathy. When sensory neurons are disturbed, you develop paresthesias, pains and tingling feelings and numbness. When motor nerves are disturbed, you develop lower motor neuron type of layons. Then I told you in very big detail that in the spinal cord, yes, you people will answer me. Posterior column undergo degeneration and lateral columns undergo degeneration. Here, fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus, they degenerate. And here, corticospinal pathway. So, motor system as well as, sorry, sensory system as well as motor system combined degeneration. What, are they, what is it called? We discussed into very big detail previously. Subacute combined Degeneration of spinal cord, B12 deficiency. Of course, this will not be seen in folic acid deficiency. And we discussed the how this produces upgoing Babinski sign, how it produces hyporeflexia or hyperreflexia in the ankle or knee jerk. Clear? No problem? 
So pernicious anemia patient will have alt uh, changes in the bone marrow, changes in peripheral blood picture. They will have uh, demyelinating layers in the peripheral nerves as well as specially spinal cord combined degeneration. Is that right? In very severe cases, even degeneration or demyelinations in higher central higher part of the central nervous system which may translate into neuropsychiatric syndromes is that right or dementia we have discussed that now we come to the changes in GIT when you talk about pernicious anemia in the changes GIT changes are most significant in the mucosa of the stomach in the fundus region because autoimmune process was primarily against the parietal cells is that right so parietal cells are destroyed by the autoimmune process and when parietal cells are destroyed and these gastric glands are destroyed so mucosa become atrophied and you see this area is heavily infiltrated by lymphocytes and plasma cells this indicates that autoimmune attack is in the gastric mucosa gastric mucosa most of the gastric glands are destroyed right and there is infiltration of auto reactive lymphocytes is that right that is a, these changes you cannot reserve uh, reverse by giving b12 secondly i told you b12 and folic acid deficiency and if it is pernicious anemia we are discussing then only b12 deficiency also produces problem with the proliferation of git cells in previous lectures we discussed when cells on the tongue mucosa don't proliferate well then you don't have the villi on the tongue tongue becomes smooth and glazed and thin mucosa of the tongue shows the tongue muscles from inside so it look like a beefy tongue like a beef that is a very special feature of b12 and folic acid of course it is present in pernicious anemia also is that right no problem into this moreover a very important thing if you have severe b12 deficiency eventually all git mucosal cells will undergo megaloid reaction you know git mucosal cells replicate very fast Every few days your GIT mucosal cells are chained. In 5 to 7 days your GIT mucosal cells are shed and new cells are replacing them. So it means proliferative capacity of normal GIT cell is very high. But if you have suppose, severe B12 deficiency, these cells will not proliferate well. And they become abnormal. They will become very large. Their, their power of absorption will be reduced. So B12 deficiency produces megaloblastosis in the GAT lining also Meg megaloid reaction you can say so primary problems are b12 deficiency but such abnormal cell will not later on absorb folic acid also so it will become eventually combined deficiency and here it's worth mentioning if primarily you have folic acid deficiency that will also produce the same changes in most of the GAT cells of course not these changes right autoimmune changes are not there but if i have severe folic acid deficiency again my GIT cells will become megaloid and they will absorb not well and if a very long term folic acid deficiency eventually b cell deficiency will also develop due to malabsorption am i clear so this is very important to know that if one of these vitamin if it deficiency is deficient initially for severely and for long time other vitamin deficiency will be also seen is it clear Let's recap. Of course, there are few more things. In case of pernicious anemia, not only we have autoreactive atrophy of autoimmune atrophy of these cells, not only we have antibodies against the parietal cells and antibodies against the intrinsic factors, not only we are having megaloid reaction throughout here, we have also discussed there are changes in the bone marrow, changes in the blood picture, and changes maybe in the neurological system. But we have to talk about some biochemical changes also. What are those biochemical changes? If you check the blood, of course, blood level of folic as B12 will be low. Plus, there will be another problem. In the blood, met, uh, homocysteine level will be, yes, homocysteine will be high. You remember B12 transfer the methyl to the homocysteine to produce methionine. So, in deficiency of B12, we cannot convert the homocysteine into methionine. So homocysteine level go high. Remember, homocysteine is toxic chemical for endothelial cells. So high level of homocysteine can damage the arterial and venous endothelial cell and increase the risk of arterial and venous thrombi. Is that right? So we say 
that in this disease, the severe B12 deficiency, you may have hyperhomocysteinemia. Plus, do you think malonyl CoA can be converted into succinyl CoA? No. So there will be increased level of mal malonic acid. Is that clear? These are the biochemical changes in the blood. No problem?